Back everybody, this is Dr. Bob Stark, and hey, it is time to review for exam two coming up very soon. Uh, so we talked about generics uh, at last class, and today we'll, as I said, we'll do exam two review. Those of you who are um, who'll be in in in, in class. Uh, with me or with Dr. Yang, we may have some time to, to work on project two as well. Uh, some things for pro exam two, uh, you, you are allowed a three by five note card to put notes on, front side only. You will also be allowed access to the Java 14 um, API. And you'll have questions similar to those on exam one. Um, Everything we have covered in, in, a, in uh, Unit 2, as well as everything that came before, is fair game on this exam, um, including enumerations, inheritance, polymorphism, abstract classes, uh, the, inter the specific interfaces we have uh, gone over, uh, including comparable, comparable, comparator, iterable, and collection, uh, as well as just being able to write your own interfaces. We'll also see generics and, uh, you know, other topics that are related to these things and, or ancillary to them, like instance of, data and wrapper classes, collection wrapper classes, encapsulation, information hiding, and so forth. So some review of, of a few uh, important things, uh, the first being the, the uh, enum type or the enumeration type. On the right, we see what it looks like in UML, and we will expect you to be able to interpret UML. We might even make you draw some if we if we can do it that way. Um, the name of the enumerations in the in the top box with the we call this a prototype uh, that says enumeration in the angle brackets. Uh, the enumeration values are listed in the first of the middle boxes, and then any fields and methods uh, go where they normally would. So be expected to know the benefits of enumer enumeration type and when to use. Um, specifically, you know, we, we use this in, in place of strings where we would use strings to just name things um, we need internally to our program. We use them in place of integers sometimes where the integers simply are placeholders for um, enumerated values in our program. Um, an enumeration is its own type uh, and it it has a small set of possible values, and it only allows that set of possible values. And we list those in all caps. Um, these cannot be used as integers or strings, um, though later on we can pull some tricks to, to allow them to work that way. Um, an example here would be a direction enumeration type, which has values north, south, west, and probably would have east in it as well. So uh, a a question might be, declare a variable of direction type and assigned west to it. Um, we'll also have inheritance questions on the exam. Make sure you understand inheritance uh, in UML. So here we have a, a class, which will have a name, it'll have fields and methods, and then there'll be a child class that inherits from it. And the arrow is always an open uh, triangle that points to the parent from the child. We may ask you about access modifiers in UML. We expect you to know them. Uh, minus sign is private, plus sign is public, uh, and a pound sign is protected. Italics indicate abstract classes and methods. So if the name of the class is in italics, it's abstract, and an abstract class can also have um, methods in italics to indicate they are abstract. So terminology we'll want you to know, superclass, subclass, parent class, child class, based, and or drive class. We will use all of these interchangeably. Um, you need to know about constructor chaining where um, the, the subclass will have to call a constructor in the, in the parent class. Make sure you can write code using inheritance and make sure you know how, when to use and is a relationship. And just, you know, talk it out in your head. If something is a kind of something else, that usually means the first thing is a child class of the second. Remember that the subclass inherits all methods and fields. Um, it does inherit private methods and fields, but those cannot be directly accessed in the child. Only, only public and protected things can be accessed in the child by the child. Um, a, every, con 
the first statement in every subclass is con constructor must call its superclasses and constructor. Um, the exception to this is if you intend to call the no parameter constructor in the superclass, you can leave that out because it gets called explicit, uh, implicitly. Uh, make sure you understand overwriting versus overloading. So overwriting means a method in a child class has the same uh, method signature, meaning the same method header as a method in the, in the parent class, but it creates a different body. It overrides the um, declaration of the parents. Um, and we, we typically preface those with the at override notation. Overloading occurs within methods of the same class. Um, overloaded methods have the same name, but they may have, but they will have different um, parameters and types of their parameters. Know, be able to distinguish between super and this. Know that this represents the current object. Super is used to call a method or fields in the direct parent. Know how to do typecasting. Um, make sure you know why and when it is not necessary. Um, we can always cast a child type as a type of the parent. Um, not, we can't always go the other way, but we can, in which case we get a class cast exception. Polymorphism. Um, Make sure you understand the difference um, between a variable's declared type versus its actual type, meaning it's a polymorphic variable. Um, remember, we can take a type of the child class and assign it, we can take an object of the child class and assign it to a variable type of the parent class. Dynamic binding, meaning the declared type is used at compile time to check that a method can be called on an object. The actual type is used at runtime to determine the method to be called. Um, and make sure you understand this power, um, how we can use this, um, especially in, in polymorphic collections, where the collection is of the parent type and the elements in the collection could be of any child type. Uh, know, we're gonna know about abstract classes. What is it, what is it used for, and when to use it. Um, you know, an abstract class can have everything a concrete class can, with the exception that it cannot be um, instantiated. And it can also have abstract methods, which are um, methods that um, are, are, must be implemented by uh, any class that uh, inherits from the abstract class. We typically should make our constructors protected uh, because they can't be used by, by outside classes anyway. Um, they can only be called by the by the child classes. Um, remember that a subclass must implement implement all abstract methods. If not, then it must also be an abstract class. So uh, we'll start with some some sample questions. You might like what you might see on the the exam. We have a, a UML class diagram here. And the first question, uh, if we look at that, is there a default constructor in the employee salar slash salary employee slash hourly employee class? All right, so let's look through. So right now, employee does not have a default constructor, no. So there, so salary employee does not, and hourly employee does not. Um, meaning that uh, both salary employee and hourly employee must call the, um, the explicit constructor of the, the parent employee class. Next up, can you write the code for employee and salary employee classes? Well, I'm gonna pause for a moment, or you should pause, go try that, and then come back and I will, um, I will code through that. Okay, hopefully you're back and uh, you, you've attempted that. Uh, let me pull up my text editor. So let me go back to the, there. I've got a salary employee 
and it inherits from employees. So we'll start with that. doing that so I'll get my nice syntax highlighting so public class it's salary employee extends employee so salary employee has a, a field of type double called salary Now it doesn't explicitly say in the in here that, that that's private, probably a typo, but they are private by default. Um, we have two constructors, one uh, that has string and a double. So we'll do that first. name and, and salary and so what we're going to do is we're going to call the um, the name con constructor of the parent first and then we'll do this dot salary equals salary now I, you know if we were doing if we were doing this proper we would have some some precondition checks and such but we're going to skip over those for now just to, for brevity it also has a a constructor with just a name on it so we'll do that one as well. So it calls super with name so that our, our parent and, uh, constructor is, is satisfied. And we'll just say that this dot salary, oops, auto complete error. So it's, they start out at zero because we don't really know what it's going to be. But We'll make it something. And um, the get name is already implemented in the parent. Um, we need a get salary here. Oh, I can't do that. I'm not in Eclipse. Um, we also have to um, implement a get pay method from uh, the parent because there's an abstract there so we'll do that is it, make sure it's double yes and I I mean we don't know what it what it's supposed to return because the UML doesn't tell us that but we'll just assume that it's this dot salary for now uh, we can do the similar thing for hourly employee Going to do it well, I'll do a new, new file for that. Save as employee, Java. It's public class, hourly employee, extends, em, oops, extends employee. And we have hours are double, hourly pay is a double, both of them private. Make sure I get those right. Yep. Uh, it also has a, a a two parameter constructor, the one that takes then it takes a string for the name and double for hourly pay. So we'll put those in there. the super constructor with name and then this dot hourly pay equals hourly pay and we assume let's just assume their hours start at zero we also have a name only constructor which of course must call the super constructor passing in the name 
and then I'm gonna just guess that these things start at zero. They probably should have some default that some better default values, but at this point we don't know what they are yet. It has a set hours method. And again, this should probably have ha, have um, some precondition checks, just we don't know what those preconditions are right now. Uh, reasonable ones would be we, the hours can't be less than zero. Um, we also have to implement the get pay from the parent. It's bothering me that it, the pay wasn't capitalized, but we'll use what's in the UML. And we'll return this.hours times this.hourly pay. There you go. Okay, let's look at some, some code down here. Is there anything wrong with it and why? So they've written a salary employee that has name and salary, sets the name and the salary, and uh, that is a problem because we're not calling any, um, any of the, the parent constructors. So there should, as we saw in, the, in what I just coded up, there ought to be super passing in the name there instead of that. And in fact, there is no this.name available to salary employees. Um, so there's, there's two, two issues there. The next version has tried to rectify that by calling uh, the super constructor, except there's no, no zero parameter constructor for the, the parent class. Um, and so we would once again have an error there. We need to uh, pass name in that to satisfy the parent's one parameter constructor. So this one is how do we write the second constructor of that using constructor chaining? Let's assume the default salary is 30,000. Well, we already did that, um, but let's fix my version so that uh, the default salary is 30,000. There we go. We'll even put that on there to make it look nicer. More, more questions about this inheritance set setup. Um, are there any issues in these following things? Let's look at them one by one. So we have, a, have an employee um, variable E is new employee Jane. We can't do that because employee is abstract, so we can't call new on it. Next up, we have a salary employee gets a new salary employee of Jane. Well, salary employee is concrete, so we can instantiate it. And we do have a one parameter constructor that accepts uh, a string. So yes, number two is fine. So employee E2 is assigned to E1. That's fine because uh, E1, a salary employee, is a type of employee. Uh, double capital D salary one equals E1, which is an employee dot get salary. No, sorry, no, E1 is a is a salary employee. So yes, it does have a get salary method, and that sh which returns lowercase d double, but that should um, copy across and and um, and box properly. In the next one, we have double salary two again capital D double, the wrapper style. E2.getSalary. This won't work because E2 is an employee object and there is no get salary method on employees. So E1 trying to set its hours to 4.5. Um, E1 is a salary employee and it does not have a set hours method so that won't work. Neither will E2.setHours hours to 4.5 because again it's an employee not an hourly employee which has the set hours method. Uh, in this next one, we're attempting to um, cast E2, which is an employee, to an hourly employee type. Now, we can try to do that. It's not a syntax error, but this is going to cause a class cast exception because E2 is actually a salary employee, not an hourly employee. And for that reason, neither, uh, well, sorry, never mind, I'm looking at the wrong thing. So in this one, we have uh, capital D double pay one equals E1.getPay. Uh, E1 is a salary employee, 
It doesn't show a get pay here, but there is one in its parent class that's available to it, so that will in fact work and inherits that from the parent. Um, double pay E2, pay two is E2.getPay. E2 is already an employee type. It does have a get pay, so that should work. All right. <clears throat> Talk about interfaces. Uh, review. What is an interface? When do we create one? Um, interface is just a, a collection of methods that a, an implementing class must implement. And the nice thing about them is that we can you we can implement as many interfaces on a class as we want. It's kind of like putting a mask on a on a class and making it act like something it isn't um, in certain situations. We, when we imp implement an interface, um, in, as we're seeing here in UML, the implementing class must have methods that adhere to the interface. So, um, and it must give bodies to those. Uh, know about polymorphism with interfaces, meaning you know we, you know, override those methods, and we can actually use a class of the interface type anywhere that interface is expected, like in a an array list of the interface type. Um, know what inheritance is versus inher in interfaces. Inheritance we in inherit from a concrete or an abstract class, some other class, um, and we can only extend one of those. With interfaces. We're implementing the methods that the interface specifies, and we can do that for as many interfaces as we wish. Make sure you understand the UML representation of this. Um, an interface looks like a class, except it has the interface prototype on it. And then a class that implements the interface has a dotted line with the open arrow pointing to the interface. Some important interfaces we're going to look at, or we're going to have on the test. Uh, iterable, which is a generic over a type, um, means that a collection class can uh, use the for each loop. Um, a collection is a, a collection of things. So a collection of E, whatever E become is at runtime or at compile time, is the type of things in the collection. Um, and it gives us some, some basic methods for adding and removing and so forth things from the collection. Um, it allows us to hide implementation details about the, the uh, collection and use generic algorithms there. Um, remember that collection, there's more to it than the interface. Um, so you do have to go read the specification uh, or read the API um, documents for that. Um, make sure you, you implement the two standard constructors that it requires. Um, comparable says that we can specify a, an order on um, things of that type. Uh, it's considered to be the natural or default order. Um, and when it's implemented by, by the class, it specifies the elements um, that it can order. In other words, that class T. Comparator is other orderings we can apply to a class. Um, when we implement comparator, we uh, specify how the items of those class can be compared as well. Um, it's typically implemented uh, by a separate class, not by um, the, 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 the T class here. So some questions about interfaces. Suppose we have a list of employee objects, and we assign to it a new array list of employee objects. And employees is not empty. <clears throat> We want to be able to sort all these employees by their names in descending order. Uh, what do we need to do? And I actually don't remember if, we, if there's a collection sort here. Let's uh, do a new file. And we're going to do it like it's going to involve collections.sort like that. But I want to double check and make sure it's that does it in descending order.
So that will do. This this is why my, more my intuition was telling me right. Um, if we do just collections dot sort, that's an ascending order. What if there's a reverse order? And then we can reverse that. Yeah. I figured there'd be something like that. So it actually look like, well, something like that. We'll sort it ascending, but then we want to make it descending. We'll just reverse it. Always listen to your intuition when when, when, when when something like that goes on. Looks like there's also some options. Um, you can let me pull this over where you can see it a little better. Looks like there's something called a reverse order um, where you can um, create a comparator that will um, reverse the, the ordering of, of an existing comparator. So you might be able to play some tricks with that um, to accomplish what we just did, but you know that, that's an exercise for you. Um, this should do it as well. Um, we're going to talk know about your about, excuse me, know about your generics, um, benefits of them and when to use them. Uh, main things it allows for type checking at compile time. Um, allows for us to create generic algorithms, um, things like the algorithms in the collections class, um, and understand that a generic class interface or method can work for many different types. Um, when we specify the class interface or method, a generic type is used. Um, when we instantiate an object, um, respectively implementing the interface, a specific type is, is specified. When we call a generic method, the type is implicitly specified by the actual types of the method's arguments. So here's some questions we can do. Um, first one, declare a generic class group that stores an instance variable called members, which is uh, a collection of E type. So if you do that, pause. And when you're back, I hope that you're back now, We'll talk through it. So uh, we're going to generic class group stores an instance variable called members, which is a collection of E type. Okay, let's do that. I'm just going to keep going here. Let's save this as Java. I want to get that Java extension so my editor knows to hot syntax highlight pop properly. So public class, is it groups or group? Group. E, instance variable called members, which is a collection of E type. So private E members, like that. Next, we're going to have a generic interface iRepository. It has a method getById that takes an int and returns an element of t. So uh, go work on that. And now you're back, and we'll, we'll, we'll do my, my version of that. So iRepository is the name. And did we? T for our type there. And get by ID takes an int and returns an element of T. So we'll work for that. Because this is now the return type. And now we need a generic public method add that takes an element of E type and returns Boolean. Um, I'm actually going to put that in my group just because it makes sense to do so. Like that. And 
we don't know what's going to go inside of it, but that that's the uh, that would be the method that would work in here. Uh, other things you will see: um, instance of operator. Um, questions like why would we wrap a collection? So we want to uh, seek for better encapsulation and information hiding. Um, Benefits of declaring data as iterable T, collection T, or list T. Well, you know, iterable T gives us the ability to use, use it in a for each loop. Collection T gives us the ability to use it anywhere else a collection is used. Um, list T is a, a more um, specific and says any, anywhere an ordered list is expected. Uh, all those are useful to us. All right, uh, that's it for the review. Uh, if you're in class uh, physically, we'll keep working on project two. Otherwise, um, hopefully everything went well. And um, please call or, e or please email me or your uh, instructor as needed to uh, ask questions about this. Good luck on your test.